All right, we're back at it, playing Asphyxia. And in the side Asphyxia, we are playing the game of life. Hey, Bobby, it's time to pay up. Why are you suing me? I don't even have that much money. Percy's the one who's winning, not me. That may be true, but I like Percy more than I like you, Bobby. <laughs> Therefore, I am suing you. Do you have a problem with that? So you're willing to sacrifice your own chances of victory just to make things more difficult for me. That's about the gist of it, yes. Well, at least you're honest. I don't know if that makes it any better, though. Sighing, Roberta handed over a small handful of colorful money to Georgia. Though she was irritated at Jorah's Georgia's underhanded tactics, she could not fault her. She was not, after all, breaking any rules. Even when Roberta hated whatever task she was engaged in, she always followed the rules, right down to the letter. Maybe that was why she didn't enjoy board games very much. Because she follows the rules? She was too serious. Thank you kindly. Georgia took the money with a grin, her pointed teeth glistening in her mouth like shards of broken glass. Oh, now it's my turn. Percy spun the spinner and landed on a four. She moved her little car four squares along the track, as instructed, and read the information on the square where she had landed. You go on holiday to Italy. Pay 10,000 pounds. Yes, that's what that is. Hmm. Doesn't that seem a bit steep for a holiday? It definitely does. That is a damn expensive holiday. <laughs> yes, but it doesn't specify how long you're in Italy for. For all we know, you could have stayed there for years. I suppose so. I don't know if the hot weather would be good for my skin, though. Might not be good for my children, either. You don't have any children. They're just plastic pieces. Right now, perhaps, but someday... Do you want to be a housewife that much? I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> don't snore like that, Georgia. I love children. They're just so cute with their button noses and tiny fingers. And screaming mouths and flailing limbs, rashes and scabs and dirty nappies. Urgh. Georgia shuddered. I would rather die than have any children. <laughs> it would ruin my figure, too. There are more important things in life than your figure, Georgia. Next, it was Samantha's turn. Like Percy had before her, she spun the spinner. Of course, she got it, too. It's good to go slow on the game of life, though, because then you can just get all the money. For some reason, Samantha's spins have been decidedly pathetic throughout the game, and she was lagging far behind everybody else. That is good in the game of life, because you hit more squares and get more money. <laughs> Sadly enough, this felt like a suitable representation of her own life. It was so fitting, she couldn't help but smile, though wryly. Getting so many low spins might have been a blessing if they had made her stop on squares that allowed her to collect more money, but that was not the case. Instead, she kept landing on squares that forced her to throw her money away. They were only halfway through the game, and she was nearing bankruptcy. I didn't even know you could get bankruptcy in life. Damn, Sam. At least she had a husband and three children to keep her company. Actually, make that four children. Samantha sighed as, once more, she was greeted with the news that she had given birth to yet another child. Why do you look so gloomy? The birth of a child should be a joyous occasion. I would be joyous if I had any money. We have to give you money for each child you have, though. Yes, but it won't be enough to pay for their education. <laughs> Samantha bit down on her lower lip and began to chew as she often did when troubled. It was ridiculous that a simple board game should be distressing her so much, but it was. If this was an indication of how her life was really going to pan out, she might as well hang herself from the wooden rafters right there and then. Percy had been right. The game of life really was depressing. It wasn't that much more enjoyable than real life. I'm not cut out for motherhood. I can't look after all these children. This was such a bad idea. <laughs> This is the board game. Samantha turned to look at Roberta, who was sitting to her left. Unlike her, Roberta only had one child. Roberta? Yes? If I give you a couple of my children, would you look after them for me? Samantha looked at Roberta imploringly, eyes wide, determined to unleash upon her close friend a torrent of her most silver-tongued sentiments. 
I realize this may sound like a detriment, but in the game of life, having more children is a boon. You stand to benefit a great deal from this arrangement, given you can collect money on their lives at the end of the game. It's called forward thinking, something that Samantha was notoriously bad at. The only thing I ask in exchange is a mere trifle, something I am sure a goodly woman such as yourself can part with, Bobby. <laughs> All I want is a little bit of money for your generosity to tide me over. Are you selling your children? <laughs> Do you think these terms are sound acceptable? Would you be willing to help a friend in need? You must be willing, for you have proven yourself time and time again to be such a reliable friend and one I can sell my children to. I would expect nothing less of you, Roberta. Roberta stared at Samantha in shock, her eyes wide. <laughs> Are you trying to sell your own children? Yes, that is so. Though I wish it had not come to this, desperate times call for desperate measures. I fear I can't afford to look after them, given my current circumstances. They will starve, Roberta. Do you truly want the death of my children weighing upon your conscience? You could prevent this strategy, if only you open your heart and your wallet, too. Be that as it may, it is against the rules. You can't sell your children to other players in the game of life. But, there are no buts. You made your grave, and now you must lie in it. But I'm a terrible mother. If you won't look after my children, Roberta, at least do the decent thing and call the authorities. I can't cope here. I'm sorry, Sam, but board games have rules for a reason. If we start ignoring them willy-nilly, who knows what might happen? Who knows what might happen indeed? Anarchy, no doubt. And you would love that, wouldn't you? Samantha sighed heavily, her shoulders slumping. Ah. And so it seemed all of Samantha's orating had been for naught. Her conversational skills really were getting rusty. It's pretty hard to convince somebody to buy your children from you. Anyway, Bobby has a point. You gave birth to all those kids, Sam, and now you have to face the consequences. Isn't that why you wanted to be a man, Georgia? So you'll never have to face the consequences of all your flings? Maybe. In the game, though, I only have two children. I'm a responsible father. I wonder. Just how many poor women have you have... Have you have... Have you left desolate and heartbroken after one night stands that meant nothing to you but everything to them? Who knows? I am devilishly attractive after all. You're not when you boast like that. Oh? I thought women found self-esteem attractive in men. <laughs> but you aren't a man. <laughs> I would be a terrible parent whether I was a man or a woman. Well, I can't argue with that one, Samantha sniffed. You're so cruel, Roberta. It's a weird game. I don't think I've ever gotten so into the game of life. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Georgia sniggered to herself as she surveyed the summarily defeated Roberta. To add insult to injury, Georgia was using the large wad of money she had managed to accumulate through her life as a man. The breeze just... Is she using it to gesture? What's she using it for? The breeze disrupted her fringe, making it flutter. Percy had been in the lead for most of the game, but in the later stages she landed on so many holiday squares, she lost a good deal of her accumulated wealth. Well, she's still... Let me figure out how to talk again. She still seems happy, so that's important. Georgia, being the sneak that she was, had capitalized on Percy's losses, and had, after a long, hard struggle, mantled why can't I talk? Managed to emerge victorious. Naturally, Roberta was not happy about this, even though she tried to hide it. Well, she's not trying to hide it very well. Look at her face. It's not like it matters. The game of life is all based on luck anyway. And luck is a skill no different to any other. Luck is not a skill. Not unless you were tampering with the spinner somehow. My, my. Do you really think I'd do something so underhanded? If it's you... Yes, I think you would. Over a petty children's game like this? You said it yourself, Bobby. The game of life is silly. Don't you think you're taking this too seriously? Roberta ran a hand through her ginger, decidedly not goldfish-colored curls, and harumphed. 
Well, you may have won the game of life, but we'll see about the reality. You're terrible with money. You'd never be able to raise that much without spending it all. Of course. What is the point in living if I cannot lavish myself with fine things? Jeez. It's only what I deserve. You really are a capitalist. What did you expect? I am a lady. <laughs> it would be hypocritical of me to act otherwise, wouldn't it? Wouldn't I? Never mind. I highly doubt you care about what other think people think, Georgia. At least you didn't come in last, Roberta. Isn't that some small consolation? I did far worse than you. Far worse than everyone, in fact. And if the game of life were at all an accurate picture of reality, then it spelt out a rather disastrous trajectory for Samantha. Would she, too, be saddled with a husband and children she did not want, and no money to speak of? Don't worry about it, Sam. You were playing against me. It's only natural you would lose. <laughs> Roberta pressed one hand against her chest and exhaled heavily, as a Victorian lady might if her corset was tied too tightly. All of a sudden, I'm finding it hard to breathe. Are you alright? Would you like me to open a window? No, it isn't that. It must be because this room is so crowded. It looks pretty spacious. I can't see the other bed, so I'm assuming that there's another side. Crowded? Yes. With George's massive ego. <laughs> there we go. Rather than look hurt by this comment, Georgia instead giggled, still fanning her face with her pastel covered colored money. That was a rather quick retort for you, Bobby. What do you mean, for me? Oh, I don't know. I always pegged you as being rather dim-witted, that's all. Maybe I should annoy you more, if I can inspire such witticisms. Please don't, for your own sake. If you annoyed me further than you do already, I fear I would strangle you. Ooh, how scary. A pause. And speaking of scary things, don't you think this is the perfect place for that? For what? Ghost stories, of course. Ghost stories. Why ghost stories? Is this another one of your whims? It isn't a whim, my dear Bobby. It's destiny. The setup couldn't be better. It's dark outside and we're alone in the middle of the countryside with nary a soul to hear us. Though I really don't like her personality, Georgia is probably the most entertaining character here. Save our other classmates in their own respective rooms, of course. Shay? Way to kill the mood, Bobby. I'm just being sensible. Why are you so obsessed with the macabre anyways? I think it's quite tasteless. That's because you're a dry, passionless woman who does not understand true excitement. You're a spinster in the body of a young girl. If disliking senseless gore makes me dry and passionless, so be it. But Samantha, quite unlike her friend, was quite, quite taken with George's suggestion. She nodded, a newfound flame kindled within her eyes. Ooh, that sounds like fun. I want to join in. You too? Yes, of course. I agree that horror can be somewhat sensationalized with all its fainting women and sheer nightgowns. Most of it is grounded not in human emotion, but in attempts to shock. I suppose it is not always the most sophisticated genre, and at its worst can be incredibly tasteless, but I quite like it regardless. Look at George's face! She is so shocked that Samantha is agreeing with her right now. <laughs> I think it's quite captivating. I, um, I agree with Samantha. You do? Yes. I also enjoy horror stories, to a certain degree. You don't look like the kind of person who would. Not with all that blonde hair. Okay, so is this... What color is Samantha's hair? Is it brown? Her hair's black. Roberta's hair is apparently ginger. And so... Percy's hair is blonde. Though it's white. Percy giggled, one hand held to her mouth. Looks can be deceiving. Isn't that a common theme in horror stories? The doppelganger? And again with the German. You act as though I have said something obscure, Roberta. It's a well-known phrase. The person you once thought you knew that you could trust turns out to have a secret identity, one you could have never fathomed. 
Horror seeks to explore the dark depths of human hearts, the part of ourselves buried deep inside us all that we may not even know exists. Actually, I was trying to write a poem about it. I could recite some of it to you if you like. No, no, we don't. Go ahead. Oh, really? Even I am intrigued. Wow, look at you, Sam. You're making friends. I wouldn't have gone with a poem, but hey, if it works for you, work it. Though Georgia wasted no chance to mock Roberta's creative efforts, she was far kinder to Samantha's. In fact, Georgia did genuinely enjoy much of Samantha's poetry and thought of her as being genuinely talented. Wow, really? She did not, however, tell Samantha this. How do you know? Georgia did not like lavishing praise upon anybody but herself. Well, as long as you think so? I don't know. That's weird. All right. Ahem. And after clearing her throat, Samantha began. Oh, here we go. We're in the scene. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we ran away. This poem, Christabel, was one she had been turning around in her head for a while. The poem opened with the fair and sweet heroine, Christabel, wandering through the woods at night, when she happened to stumble upon a most beautiful maiden lying underneath an oak tree. The maiden was... Damn. I want to try and do this justice, but there's a name in it. Geraldine? We're going to go with Geraldine. Samantha devoted no small period of time to describing the mysterious Geraldine, with her smooth skin, the light blue veins that crossed underneath it, and the precious gems that sparkled in her long, flowing hair. Christabel helped the weakened Geraldine to her feet, and offered her shelter in her home, for, as Samantha explained, Christabel was a sweet child, quick to trust, and eager to please. However, when Christabel and Geraldine returned to their fair heroine's room, and there lay in bed together, Geraldine became morose, and her stricken voice did seem to hint at a rather more sinister nature to her character. Oh, so how was it? Oh, we're done! That was it. How'd everybody think it went? Did you enjoy it? I missed it. Samantha peered at her fellow classmates from underneath her eyelashes. They sat there quietly in a small circle, like campers sitting at a blazing fire. Nobody was saying anything. Why weren't they saying anything? Had her small germ of an idea been really been so bad? That was what Lillian said. Lillian said, though her poetry was technically commendable, her subject matter was often too strange, too off-putting, too unintelligible for the pleasure of other people. It really... oh, dang. Why is she a ghost? Is she the memory? It doesn't really have any bearing on real life, does it? It's just fancy. Well, maybe I want to live in some fancy. That single comment of Lillian had hurt more than any other criticism of her work had. Samantha's poetry was often suffused with bizarre twists and turns. It was true, but it was not mere fancy. She poured her real emotions into these poems, and she implored the reader to understand how tortured and troubled her main characters were, just as she herself was. But other people did not see it that way. Not even Lillian, her best friend. Past best friend, anyway. Maybe that was because her characters were more frequently troubled by the supernatural than the mundane. However, despite the supernatural, there was always a touch of guilt and anxiety running underneath the gothic. Maybe nobody could tell just how intense Samathan's po poetic efforts were, or if they could, it only troubled them rather than endearing them. There was a pause. Georgia frowned, her arms folded. It was interesting. I suppose I somewhat enjoyed it, but... But... What happens next? What do you mean? The story! It just ends without any kind of conclusion! It's not very satisfying! <laughs> Samantha giggled, coyly pushing her two index fingers together. I haven't really thought that far ahead yet. I'm not very good at forward thinking. I just wanted to write something in that kind of setting, with those kinds of characters. <laughs> you mean two lesbians? You can interpret however you want, really. Isn't that one of the joys of poetry? It's not a case of interpretation. It was pretty out in the open. They start sharing the same bed the moment they first meet each other. That's because it's gothic. Emotions are always heightened in gothic stories. I thought it made sense anyway. You'll just have to suspend your disbelief. Well, I thought it was very atmospheric. Thank you, Percy. 
I just hope everything works out for Christabel in the end. Mm, Samantha nodded, her head bowed in thought. I hope thing. I hope things work out for her too. Maybe that was why Samantha had been unable to finish the poem. She had placed too much of herself inside her characters, as per usual, and was consequently struggling with how to direct their fates. Though the main reason Samantha dabbled in the supernatural was to remove herself from her subjects, she could not help but entangle her own thoughts and feelings within her words. As a writer, it was impossible for her to extricate herself from her subject matter. Unfortunately, that meant most of her poetry was shocking and painful, with no sweetness to allay the ever-present anxieties that snaked through her verses. How could she ever hope to craft a suitable conclusion for her story when her own fate remained unknown? shrouded in darkness. She could not create a suitable ending until she knew for herself whether Lillian, like Geraldine, was an antidote, antidote to her sickened soul or the very thing that had poisoned it to begin with. She did not know. How could she know? Samantha had always been bad at understanding herself. Maybe that was why she could not truly understand the motives of her own characters. Anyway, since Sam shared her story, I think it's Roberta's turn now. Alright. And we shall return on Roberta's decision. It's really nice. Um, I did not think Georgia would be kind to anybody because she was interested in something. She seems like the kind of person who, even if something was interesting to her, she'd still belittle it. But, I don't know. Maybe there's more to Georgia... I cannot talk for to save my life here. Maybe there's more to Georgia than we previously thought. And we'll probably see more of that once we get into these more of these stories. But for now, we'll cut it right before Roberta's story. So, I'll see you in the next episode, and we'll be getting ready to be scared, maybe? Slightly spooked? Possibly? We'll see. Later.